Miriam by Truman Capote. For several years, Mrs. H. T. Miller lived alone in a pleasant apartment, two rooms with a kitchenette, in a remodeled brownstone near the East River. She was a widow. Mr. H. T. Miller had left a reasonable amount of insurance. Her interests were narrow, she had no friends to speak of, and she rarely journeyed farther than the corner grocery. The other people in the house never seemed to notice her. Her clothes were matter of fact, her hair iron gray, clipped and casually waved. She did not use cosmetics. Her features were plain and inconspicuous. On her last birthday, she was 61. Her activities were seldom spontaneous. She kept the two rooms immaculate, smoked an occasional cigarette, prepared her own meals, and tended a canary. Then she met Miriam. It was snowing that night. Mrs. Miller had finished drying the supper dishes and was thumbing through an afternoon paper when she saw an advertisement of a picture playing at the neighborhood theater. The title sounded good, so she struggled into her beaver coat, laced her galoshes, and left the apartment, leaving one light burning in the foyer. She found nothing more disturbing than the sensation of darkness. The snow was fine, falling gently, not making an impression on the pavement. The wind from the river cut only at street crossings. Mrs. Miller hurried, her head bowed, oblivious as a mole, burrowing a blind path. She stopped at a drugstore and bought a package of peppermints. A long line stretched in front of the box office. She took her place at the end. There would be, a tired voice groaned, a short wait for all seats. Mrs. Miller rummaged in her leather handbag until she collected exactly the correct change for admission. The line seemed to be taking its own time and, looking around for some distractions, she suddenly became conscious of a little girl standing under the edge of the marquee. Her hair was the longest and strangest Mrs. Miller had ever seen, absolutely silver white like an albino's. It flowed waist length in smooth, loose lines. She was thin and fragilely constructed. There was a simple, special elegance in the way she stood with her thumbs in the pockets of a tailored plum velvet coat. Mrs. Miller felt oddly excited, and when the little girl glanced toward her, she smiled warmly. The little girl walked over and said, Would you care to do me a favor? I'll be glad to if I can, said Mrs. Miller. Oh, it's quite easy. I merely want you to buy a ticket for me. They won't let me in otherwise. Here, I have the money. And she gracefully handed Mrs. Miller two dimes and a nickel. They went to the theater together. An usherette directed them to a lounge. In 20 minutes, the picture would be over. I feel just like a genuine criminal, said Mrs. Miller gaily as she sat down. I mean, that sort of thing's against the law, isn't it? I do hope I haven't done the wrong thing. Your mother knows where you are, dear. I mean, she does, doesn't she? The little girl said nothing. She, unbo she unbuttoned her coat and folded it across her lap. Her dress underneath was prim and dark blue. A gold chain dangled about her neck, and her fingers, sensitive and musical-looking, toyed with it. Examining her more attentively, Mrs. Miller decided the truly distinctive feature was not her hair, but her eyes. They were hazel, steady, lacking any childlike quality whatsoever, and because of their size, seemed to consume her small face. Mrs. Miller offered a peppermint. What's your name, dear? Miriam, she said, as though in some curious way it were information already familiar. Why isn't that funny? My name's Miriam, too, and it's not a terribly common name, either. Now don't tell me your last name is Miller, she asked Miriam. But isn't that funny? Moderately, said Miriam, and rolled a peppermint on her tongue. Mrs. Miller flushed and shifted uncomfortably. You have such a large vocabulary for such a girl. Do I? Well, yes, said Mrs. Miller, hastily changing the topic, too. Do you like the movies? I really do. Wouldn't know, said Miriam. I've never been before. Women began filling the lounge. 
The rumble of the newsreel bombs exploded in the distance. Mrs. Miller rose, tucking her purse under her arm. I guess I'd better be running now if you want to get a seat, she said. It was nice to have met you. Miriam nodded ever so slightly. It snowed all week. Wheels and footsteps moved soundlessly on the street, as if the business of living continued secretly behind a pale but impenetrable curtain. In the falling quiet, there was no sky or earth, only snow lifting in the wind, frosting the window glass, chilling the rooms, deadening and hushing the city. At all hours, it was necessary to keep a lamp lighted, and Mrs. Miller lost track of the days. Friday was no different from Saturday, and on Sunday, she went to the grocery store. Closed, of course. That evening, she scrambled eggs and fixed a bowl of tomato soup. Then, after putting on a flannel robe and cold creaming her face, she propped herself up in bed with a hot water bottle under her feet. She was reading the Times when the doorbell rang. At first, she thought it must be a mistake, and whoever it was would go away, but it rang and rang and settled into a persistent buzz. She looked at the clock, a little after 11. Did not seem possible. She was always asleep by 10. Climbing out of bed, she trotted barefoot across the living room. I'm coming, please be patient. The latch was caught. She turned it this way and that way, and the bell never stopped for an instant. Stop it, she cried. The bolt gave way, and she opened the door an inch. What in heaven's name? Hello, said Miriam. Why, hello, said Mrs. Miller, stepping hesitantly into the hall. You're that little girl. I thought you'd never answer, but I kept my finger on the button. I knew you were home. Aren't you glad to see me? Mrs. Miller did not know what to say. Miriam, she saw, wore the same plum velvet coat, and now she also had a beret to match. Her hair was white. Her white hair was braided into two shining plates and looped at the ends with enormous white ribbons. Since I've waited so long, you could at least let me in, she said. It's awfully late. Miriam regarded her blankly. What difference does that make? Let me in. It's cold out here and I have a silk dress. Then, with a gentle gesture, she urged Mrs. Miller aside and passed into the apartment. She dropped her coat and bray on a chair. She was indeed wearing a silk dress, white silk, white silk in February. The skirt was beautifully pleated along the sleeves and the sleeves long. It made a faint rustle as she strode about the room. I like your place, she said. I like the rug, blue's my favorite color. She touched a paper rose in a vase on the coffee table. Imitation, she commented wanly. How sad, aren't imitations sad? She seated herself on the sofa, daintily spreading her skirt. What do you want? Mrs. Miller asked. Sit down, said Miriam. It makes me nervous to see people stand. Mrs. Miller sank to a hassock. What do you want? She repeated. You know, I don't think you're glad I came. For a second, Mrs. Miller was without an answer. Her hand motioned vaguely. Miriam giggled and pressed back on a mound of chintz pillows. Mrs. Miller noticed the girl was less pale than she remembered. Her cheeks were flushed. How did you know where I lived? Miriam frowned. That's no question at all. What's your name? What's mine? But I'm not listed in the phone book. Oh, let's talk about something else. Mrs. Miller said, Your mother must be insane to let a child like you wander around at all hours of the nights. And in such ridiculous clothes, she must be out of her mind. Miriam got up and moved to a corner where a covered bird cage hung from a ceiling chain. She peeked under the cover. It's a canary, she said. Would you mind if I woke him? I'd like to hear him sing. Leave Tommy alone, said Mrs. Miller anxiously. Don't you dare wake him. Certainly, said Miriam. But I don't see why I can't hear him sing. And then, have you anything to eat? I'm starving. Even milk and a jam sandwich would be fine. Look, said Mrs. Miller, arising from the hassock. Look, if I make some nice sandwiches, will you be a good child and run along home? It's past midnight, I'm sure. It's snowing, reproached Miriam, and cold at dark. 
Well, you shouldn't have come here to begin with, said Mrs. Miller, struggling to control her voice. I can't help the weather. If you want anything to eat, you'll have to promise to leave. Miriam brushed a braid against her cheek. Her eyes were thoughtful, as if weighing the proposition. She turned toward the birdcage. Very well, she said. I promise. How old is she? Ten? Eleven? Mrs. Miller, in the kitchen, unsealed a jar of strawberry preserves and cut four slices of bread. She poured a glass of milk and paused to light a cigarette. Why she come? Her hand shook as she held the match, fascinated, till it burned her finger. The canary was singing, singing as he did in the morning and at no other time. Miriam, she called. Miriam, I told you not to disturb Tommy. There was no answer. She called again. All she heard was the canary. She inhaled the cigarette and discovered that she had lighted the cork tip end and, oh, I, I really mustn't lose her temper. She carried the food on a tray and set it on the coffee table. She saw first that the birdcage still wore its tight cover and Tommy was singing. It gave her a queer sensation and no one was in the room. Mrs. Miller went through an alcove leading into her bedroom. At the door, she caught her breath. What are you doing? She asked. Miriam glanced up and in her eyes was a look that was not ordinary. She was standing by the bureau a jewel case opened before her. For a minute, she studied Mrs. Miller, forcing their eyes to meet, and she smiled. There's nothing good in here, she said, but I like this. Her hand held a cameo brooch. It's charming. Suppose, perhaps you'd better put it back, said Mrs. Miller, feeling suddenly the need of some support. She leaned against the door frame. Her head was unbearably heavy. A pressure weighted the rhythm of her heartbeat. The light seemed to flutter defectively. Please, child, a gift from my husband. But it's beautiful, and I want it, said Miriam. Give it to me. As she stood, striving to shape a sentence which would somehow save the brooch, it came to Mrs. Miller that there was no one to whom she might turn. She was alone, a fact that had not been among her thoughts for some long time. Its sheer emphasis was stunning, but here in her own room were evidences she could not ignore or, she knew with startling clarity, resist. Miriam ate ravenously, and when, she had the when the sandwiches and milk were gone, her fingers made cobweb movements over the plate, gathering crumbs. The cameo gleamed on her blouse, the blonde profile like a trick reflection on its wearer. That was very nice, she sighed, though now an almond cake or a cherry would be ideal. Sweets are lovely, don't you think?